There we go, it's working. How's it going, Nathan? You alright? Yeah, I'm gonna try Balenciaga Harry Potter. I thought it was really funny. Uh, this guy over here. <laughs> and hopefully you guys will learn something from it. I didn't prep it or anything, I didn't tell anyone about it, it's just like a, a random stream. In the meantime, um, if people are joining, I don't know if they will see this on sort of like their YouTube. I'll start with, I'm going to do it for about like an, an hour or two or something. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to um, show some tricks while I'm doing something that's like fairly interesting, this guy. Let's get all the, let's get all the prep and the boring stuff out of the way. Yeah, so my plan is to basically um, get a couple of references into here. I, I'm only using the primary front face of like this Balenciaga character. Um, but usually what I'll do is I'll split that up in Photoshop and then basically draw some construction lines. That's going to help me when I put it into PureF. Um, so I don't usually make a video on how to set up references, but um, I'll do it on the live and, and convert it. So yeah, usually the first one I do is the the basic shape and I'll put it on a layer and then that means I can hide and export it with transparency into uh, ZBrush. So like usually I'll, what I'll start with is like a primary form like this. Um, when it comes to matching a reference, I usually like to do it by eye primarily, but the very start it's useful to get that um, that sort of like reference, especially because he's got glasses. It's going to be important depending on where it's going to be located on the head. Um, so I think I can basically like draw these out as well. Obviously my circle drawing skills are crap, but <laughs> it's, it's only for basically like locations. Um, potentially this, he's got a really weird shaped head. Like it's not very realistic. It's kind of this extended shield that tapers down to the bot like an extreme. Another useful one I do, I also pinpoint the eye center. So when I'm positioning the eye, it's basically gonna be easier. So I usually just cross that very slightly. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll mark the either side of the eyeball so I can get the, the iris line basically in the eye length. Um, and I do the same with the top and the bottom. Can also be good for the corners of the mouth. So instead of doing it by eye, you can just sort of like put it on top in Z brush and then match them. And maybe potentially the tip of the nose or where the nostrils end and basically like enter into the face. Cool. I'll also, um, I'll also crop this quite heavily because I don't want all this wasted space. Obviously, we, we might eventually do this piece of clothing, but I can always come back to a different reference if I want to do that. Um, ideally, it's just getting rid of excess waste that's going to be on uh, my Z brush screen. I don't want too much of that. The difficult difficult one with this is there's not going to be a front or side view. So that we've got the front, but there's no um, three fourths. There's no. This is like the only shot we've got to go off. So I'm going to be doing a lot of head from memory, um, and then obviously there's like the Daniel Radcliffe reference that I might might be able to go back to. So let's export these. Save as, let's put some PNGs, or we can go export PNG.
You're working on some fur shaders. Is, is that from the Yoda video? Or is it sort of like uh, more alpha fur? Tell you what, with this one, also what I sometimes do is just do like a central central line to understand where the, the center is going to be, like that. Hide the uh, hide the background, and I'll quick export or export a PNG without uh, with a transparent background. Let's guide. <laughs> I'm not too sure. It's just like generic tavern in music, fan fancy medieval music. I was just basically looking for something that wasn't copyrighted. Hello. So I promised myself if I hit, once I hit five viewers, I'll move into ZBrush. Big goals. Um, the reason I didn't didn't put this on a schedule or tell anyone is um, just in case sort of like the audio was crap or all those sorts of things. So is that all working? Can, it, can anyone confirm it? Oh yeah, yeah. That shade is really good for making carpets, um, carpets and shirling fur. But that's that's kind of the extent that it can do. All right, let's sub some references. spotlight for this so the the original reference we'll use in the guides turn the spotlight on that looks so funny it does help though sometimes <laughs> like when you need to um when you need to overlay it without the opacity on, it's really helpful. But I appreciate it, it looks really funny. <laughs> cool. Well, let's get started. So, yeah, if I sculpt from a sphere, um, I could be starting from a base mesh, but for something artistic like this, I like to do it from a sphere because you can get the um, the macros and the large forms like very quickly. With the uh, adjusted mesh, you'll find that it will just end up looking like the base mesh, so it's, it's quite nice just to start from scratch. If I was doing a head, um, I teach all the students to start from the side planes, basically the area that's going to create the temporal line. So for example, let's make this Polymesh 3D. So if you see my brush isn't working, it might be spotlight projection. Let's check that out. Yeah. If you pull in a reference and the um, it's not working, I believe if you go to brushes and then you've got um, samples, you need to turn off spotlight projection because then your brush isn't going to go through um, the projection. But anyway, with trim dynamic, I usually just create the sides. Um, you could use a cutting tool for that but that creates a really nice temporal line and for this Harry Potter character he hasn't got much of a strong one I know it's like AI generated um, it seems to be sort of like smoothed over so once that's in usually what I do is just create a very small indication of the halfway point which is going to be the eyes um, and then this can all adjust later the main thing is that we've got that landmark there 
So say, for example, at some point we wanted to take it over to here and reference it, at least we've got that landmark to pull from. Um, so, you know, while we're here, we can actually just start to shape the generic style. Um, before doing that and bringing it over, I like to put in some, some more key landmarks. Um, so you could sort of like mask the, the jaw here and pull it out. That can be quite a cool technique. Um, and if you're a bit more experienced, sometimes you can just pull things out. Uh, really important where you're going to be pulling it. So for example, if we pull it from the side of the face, we're obviously going to get a very large square jaw. But then if you pull it from the border, it's going to be more tapered. So that's something really to, to bear in mind. Um, so first basically going to, and you see the eye stretching, that's, that's totally fine. Sort of look at the reference to start with and try and get like a basic indication of shape. So this can all change. I also like to put in a bit of a jawline, maybe an indicator where the, the ear is going to be. Just a little slot and then we'll add that as a, as a subtool later. He's got quite um, quite a, a bony model look. So what I'd usually start with is trying to make a bit of a skull first and then build um, skin on top of that. So if you imagine that the first target is to build this guy's skull. So we could put in eye landmarks then from the temporal line we have it starts to bring out like a, a natural eyebrow ridge and then we can use that later. Um, also I can go in under that's going to create our cheekbones this guy's got very big cheekbones cheekbones going to be the widest part of the face so around here is actually the, the widest part of human's head um, and there's also a secondary point sort of like up here which is also going to be quite large um, so we'll probably come back to that later and scoop it out um, at this point to bring out the jaw I usually like to eat away at the back of the cranium like that and then we can insert a neck in later but it just means that we can start to move this jaw without accidentally moving all the the sort of like the large shapes in the back so just aim for something that's sort of like roughly a skull shape um, cool so at this point we're going to work on the silhouettes or like the outside of the character first so just getting the the first iconic shapes which is like this um this quite sharp sharp jawline um, there's also a very large taper on the overall shape of the head so I'm going to try and sort of put that in it's not, it's not so realistic but we're just going to have to bear with it <laughs> cool here's probably we're running out of a little bit of geometry so I would dynamesh it always good to do a low resolution I aim for like by default I aim for 64 um, it's just about enough to stop me going too far into the details um, and it's sometimes useful to basically like move individual bits of geometry to create a, a face. Um, for this guy as well, I'll do a very basic outline. When I'm sculpting I don't actually like to put in eyes until the very end because it's super useful to create this um, this inside skull eye line. You can also insert just random landmarks so uh, we know the mouth is roughly going to be here somewhere so that's going to be nice um, and try and align that to other features in, in the place so for example his uh, corner of his mouth is seeming to line up with the angle of his jaw so we can take that interpretation and just move this uh, mouth up slightly to represent that just means it's going to be a bit more accurate okay um, we can put in I usually like to put in the bone of the nose first and then work on around the nose bridge and then the nose the actual nose itself is something I'll put in towards the end um, a good thing to do as well is just zoom out really really far and this makes us focus on the overall shapes so we can get a really large move brush and make really big edits so um, I know the Harry Potter character has quite squished and square jawline, so we can introduce that. Cool. Don't forget to um, work on the side because obviously we've only got a front reference here. 
Um, usually what I aim for is aligning the eyes to the bottom of the chin, so something like this. And then let's bring the jaw back. We lost our ear reference and you can also um, fix the shape of the head. Um, when I'm teaching students, something that they'll uh, often look over is the shape of the skull itself. So at this point it's worth looking at it from the top. So um, the front of the cranium sort of tapers in and gives this egg, egg effect. So if you put in these landmarks earlier, everything that you add on top is going to adhere to some nice anatomy. Um, another one is also the lower part of the chin. So if you look at the bottom of someone's chin, what sort of shape is that going to have? Um, obviously this is seems to have worked quite well already, um, but you want to go for that natural bowing shape. And remember there's going to be teeth in there, so that's the shape that you're going for. I'll put a very slight indication of where it is going to be, just so it doesn't mess up the front of the silhouette. Okay, it's looking a bit like uh, South Park there. Let's see what you guys are saying. Will I feel more Balenciaga? I am Balenciaga. <laughs> That's why I'm doing it, I guess. Okay. Um, right, now what I'm going to do is basically put in some character. I usually get a very big brush and then smooth away all the details. Um, a, a pretty iconic part of this reference is his mouth. So we can start to introduce that. Um, when I'm working on the mouth, I basically like to work around it and then go inwards. So for example, we'd start with the chin. He's got quite a, a pronounced divot here. You can also use trim brush to really define that feature. Um, and also we've got around the mouth these sort of very large pads that's where a lot of muscles connect is, um, and for opening and closing your mouth so we can insert those smooth them away his sort of lead up back into his cheekbone and then because he's sucking in his cheeks that's um, that's going to come inwards like that there's also a bit of a, a looping shape here so I could get a damn standard and, and just bring that in sort of like a W shape we also can do the top of the lip or like in between the nose and the mouth. So if I come down this way and as I start to work on the outside bits, um, a mouth will sort of just appear out of nowhere, which is quite cool. Divot in. So here's the benefits of using quite low geometry. You can just literally move verts um, and it keeps the lines quite straight when you do it. So ironically, this Harry, he's going to look a bit like Voldemort to start with, because <laughs> he hasn't got a nose, but... Okay, at this point it's probably safe to put in a little bit of a mouth indication. Uh, it's going to be hard because there's not too much geometry to work with, but you can sort of imagine it with your mind's eye, and we can also move these points to try and represent it. Lips can be one of the hardest things because as soon as you move, I mean the difference between this, just a couple of millimetres is like a completely different expression. Um, so it's especially hard when you've got pouting characters like this one. Okay, maybe we can bring out a bit of a nose out of nothing. So that's why I leave the nose to the end because um, we create all the structure beneath it first. Because if you imagine you've already sculpted the nose, it's going to be very hard to make this this surface area. Um, so with the nose, I like to lead it straight down like this, where it connects to the face. And then a very important move is on the inside of the nose and the eye. I'll just get this bit of clay and then pull it all the way back. And then that's going to give the bone structure around the eye. Um, often missed because it's such a hard angle to achieve so while I'm here I'll also do the the shape of the brow from the top just to make sure that's all right 
how long have I been in the industry for? Oh, about, I think it's like 10 years or something. Approaching that. So yeah, so I've been in the games, I, games industry went before Substance does Painter existed. Let's, let's put it like that. Okay, at this point I'll probably put some more resolution, like especially if you're working on the nose. That's infamous for needing a little bit more, so maybe 120. And when you do go up, usually what I do is I smooth everything back away. And I'll continue to repeat that process again and again. Okay, so let's make some progress. How about you guys? Uh, where are you from? Are you in the games industry? Are you studying or sort of just hobbyists? So with the nose, what I usually do, um, it will have a lot of work on it. So I like to get this uh, sort of diamond shape and I'll create it with a damn standard. You can see it's kind of like a, an Ethereum shape, if you know what that is, like turned around. Um, and then I'll get a heavy use of trim dynamics. So I'll just create a front leading face for the nose. Take these two structures on the side. That'll count as the side of the nose. Um, you can put a damn standard here to get the loops but usually what you find is that the skin and the nostrils blend back into the head because obviously those those tubes in your nose go back in into your head um, so they're actually quite deep and then before I put nostril holes in I'll just do um, a flat surface like that on either side and then that means I can focus on the the shape itself so here it's looking a bit a bit long I'll push it back Sort of like like in this structure. If you ever want to bring back some bone, I use a clay tube and then use a technique called cross hatching, and you can just go like this, radiate out, and that's going to create a nice bow line. Um, I also like to do the bottom on the chin. And that gives a nice rounded effect. Gives us the geometry for the um, the outside of the mandible. And then you can get a dam standard and then just lead on the inside and that's going to create a nice door effect and then you can fill it in with the skin with like a, a clay brush okay let's tighten up his jaw for tightening up the jaw i just use a pinch brush it's very useful for that So a bit of anatomy, um, we've got the cheekbones here, and obviously cheekbones are going to play a large part, but I mean, it's hard to see there because it's covered by glasses. Um, but what you're looking for with the cheekbone, and here the mouth barrel, is a very large trim brush if I, if I indicate it here. It's going to be a flat surface like that, and that's what's giving his, um, his look here. So you somewhat want to introduce that and make sure it leads all the way to the mouth. So in flattening there, I know that the um, the angles line up quite nicely, and then usually with the back of the the jaw here creates another line, and then that's going to be angled towards the corner, so something like that. And you can shape the jaw from there. Hello guys. Yeah, I recognise some of your. Um, icons from Discord.
So, I mean, one of the fun things about teaching, uh, I mean, one of the fun things about game art is that you obviously get to create cool things. Um, and when you start creating cool things, you're obviously doing it in silence and you're listening to a podcast or something like that. It can be quite nice. Um, with teaching, you're kind of doing two things at once. <laughs> so you've got to make something cool, but also at the same time, you've got to uh, be informative. And streaming is an interesting one because the third layer to that is um, keeping up with you guys. I started 3D beginning this year. I started on projects in base mess. Do you think this is cheating? I mean, only, I mean, so it's only cheating if it's, um, if you're learning and I've mentioned it in a video and the only person that you'd be cheating is yourself. But, um, if you're confident that you can create a base mesh, um, and you've done it, maybe say, let, let's say like 10 times, it's totally fine to download a base mesh to create something else. Um, maybe you want to show some other skills like your sculpting ability or retop you wouldn't be creating a head like this from scratch every time it would be really efficient inefficient so that's really for you to decide to be honest um, for the first to be honest if you did it for the first one or two years if you didn't use a base mesh you'd get very good at making heads um, so I think the reason that I can usually make a head without a reference is because I've gone through starting from scratch a base mesh many times and to be honest base meshes didn't really exist that much um, like this whole YouTube culture and it'd be very hard to find a tutorial or any form formal education so there's so many there's so many more resources nowadays Okay, let's get let's sort this nose out. So he's got quite a divoted in classic nose. With the inside of the nostril, usually a cool trick I do to isolate this. We don't have too much geometry to, to use. You want it to curl round, almost imagine like a, a bit of a hook. So a mistake people make is that it leads all the way and vanishes back into the head. Whereas if you hook it back, like it's trying to come this way and then point out again, it usually creates quite a nice silhouette. And then when you're working from the front and trying to replicate a shape, it's quite it's sometimes quite difficult. So I'd avoid using the front view that much. Try and use three fourths views because the front view is going to be dependent on so many factors. So for example, if we do an inside piece of geometry here, I should get a tiny bit more geometry. Okay, so there we go. I want to do some cool stuff instead of working on anatomy. Anatomy is boring. Yeah, anatomy is boring. Um, I think it's it's going to help you do the cool things that you want to do. So, for example, um, I've done a lot of creature characters, and when I'm sort of being creative and creating different sorts of um, creatures, it comes from a fundamental of knowing the mechanics of like muscles and uh, bones and things like that. So, if you know how to make a human body, maybe like a bovine or something, um, it is gonna help you in the fun part which is the creative the creative process so I wouldn't give it up too too quickly right let's sort this out nothing I do before I put eyes in whoa that nose is looking funny let's move that all away I like to put a very like rudimentary eye in and then what I do is get damn standard and make it look like he's closing his eyes. That means that when we're moving the mesh around, we don't care about destroying the eyes or the eye sockets that we do. But the benefit with this is you can actually already start to make the shape. So if we isolate here, make these horrible like clams. So push the backs of the eye, so it wraps around the eyeball like this. 
So as long as it looks like someone closing their eyes, you're you're on the right track. And then we come in later and then just replace that with um, some proper geometry. Okay, so... So here I'm using a trim dynamic and very faintly the mouth is starting to appear out of nowhere um, and I'm trying to focus on edges and planes like this and attack it from all angles basically. Nice reference here, yeah. I love these creepy AI generated videos. I'm from Hungary and work in an indie VR studio. I think I found your channel one or two months ago. Cool. Yeah, nice to have you here, man. Okay, what I'm going to do, because this head needs to get wider. I'm going to append um, a sphere and then get a very rough indication of his hair. And then I'll move on to actually um, making sure that it matches this reference, like in terms of where I've placed everything. Um, so up until now, it's just been really about landmarks. So this will, once this is in, first of all, it will look very strange to start with. But, um, <laughs> Afro. Okay, let's break some geometry. Really cool thing is like broken geometry kind of looks like hair. So it comes in useful quite often. So get um, with the ear usually what I do is I select the main mesh come to I'm in primitive add one of these crappy little um, spheres position that and then because it's on the sub tool means it's very easy to manipulate with the main head but I also can use um, masking to isolate it so so I'm very basic Not nice geometry. He's uh, he's got weird ass like AI generated ears that are kind of poking out a bit. Maybe the um, maybe the AI picked up the like fantasy lore and then decided that kind of elfy looking ears was was adequate. So the cool thing about this is you can use Sculptures Pro if you want a little bit more control without breaking things. Yeah, I actually don't want to do the ear yet. I just want a bit of the... Uh, the initial shape. 
is mainly for the front for the front silhouette because I'm going to be putting some glasses on there. So bring this down. Note where it's, it is. So usually the bottom of the ear correlates to the bottom of the nose. Um, we're going to move all this around anyway, so it's all it's all going to change. But it's roughly in that sort of area. And then the top of the ears usually align with around the eyes, and that's why you can wear glasses. Okay, so as demonstration, like if I use move now, they will move, move together, or I can use the polyframes and then just move them independently, so it's very useful. So you guys, are you working as we speak or doing some other things on this fine Sunday? So I was uh, I was very close to not doing this stream because last night I kind of injured my shoulder. <laughs> I was doing some weird stretches um, and my right shoulder feels a bit funny, even, even drawing it now. But... Um, one thing I usually like to do, if I feel crappy and like don't feel like doing um, 3D art, or there's a very viable excuse, um, one thing I like to do is just really go against it and see see if I can impress myself by like persevering with it. Um, and I basically use that technique throughout learning and stuff, and it's been very useful. So you know, if you're feeling ill, try and super impress yourself and see if you can, in the hardest state, continue to make art. Um, and then you, you build up this kind of like invincibility thing and um, it will help you in the future. Also brutal one is that it's a really nice day today. So. <laughs> okay, let's wear this nose. some rough eyebrows in there uh, it's totally fine to add those because we can just smooth it out later it's not too much of an issue
Okay, now what I need, uh, his face looking a bit long. Yeah, I'm down south, down in uh, down south England. You're back in London. Oh, I must must be very expensive there. Okay, these lips, these are going to get fixed when we get a bit more geometry. Let's put some glasses in because that is going to be very important. Um, glasses, we can do uh, a bit of a boolean, I reckon. So, two cylinders. in the folder so the thickness of the glasses are going to change depending on the size so I do want to get the scale first let's go Oh, we shall go live boolean, turn this into a minus, make sure it's the right way around. There we go. Now, what I will do is um, make this a boolean mesh. Now, why didn't that work? I'm going to save it. I have a weird feeling it's going to crash. Oh, uh, right, I've, I think I've still got these activated, that's why. Oh, there we go, it's added. Something like this. So here's where the eyeball technique comes in. We can sort of like move these towards the eye and not worry about messing up too much.
not to gas you up too much, but it blows my mind that your approach is so direct towards form and feature. I've spent four and a half years 3D and it exciting to learn, or exciting to learn new ways to go about it. Yeah, everyone does it different ways. Um, sometimes I do it different ways depending if I want to have just like a bit of fun or if I want to do production, it will be completely different. So um, production, I'd probably have a little bit more set up. I'd have more references. I do, I do a far better job than uh, doing this, and I'd be actually pretty much sculpting on top of that. Um, but this is like a nice bit of practice, just looking at reference and trying to match it roughly. So while we're here, let's try it out. So there we go. I've got. Oh look, I've done all right. <laughs> Holy shit! I might have done fucking perfect. Wait. So, the reason this is useful, I mean, it's a bit of a throw off because the lines are so thick. Um, there's definitely improvements we could do. So, let's just like close the jaw up a little bit and then increase the hair size. That's going to be very important. Okay, center of the face is good. Nose position, mouth position, called the, ma the mouth is all right. Uh, the eyeballs potentially could come down slightly especially on its, its corners okay right next thing I forgot to put ears in that that can be quite useful next thing I do add a neck Does a head don't look like a head unless it's got a neck Okay, so neck size is usually aimed at the corners of the jaw. So maybe let's get another light in here somewhere. I have. Any questions so far while I'm sort of looking for this um, this bit of light? Okay, so if you see here, I'm sculpting from a distance. This is usually a good process. Um, I like to coin it as fit from a distance or FFD. Fit from, oh no, FFAD. Fit from a distance. So you keep on saying that. And as long as it looks good from, from a distant space, you're doing all right. Okay, just creating something that could look like a neck.
So I usually do that, this sort of weird shape when I first do it, because it means it's nice to stretch out some, some skin here. And we'll blend that in later. Leaning forwards a bit too much, way too much. And these parts of the muscles go all the way up to the head here. Just make sure that connection is kind of looking okay. Case. Let's just make this the neck itself, not the traps, because we can add them later. And also he's got a um, bit of a shirt on. Okay, he's looking a bit like Hench Harry Potter. Let's uh, straighten up the neck. Okay, so the only reason I want this here to start with, because when it blends all back together, it's much easier to make, um, is just so I can get this this silhouette. That's all I really want. <laughs> I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. He's meant to be attractive. There we go. Um, how do you approach learning change over the years in the industry? So I started with, um, well, first of all, just like consistently doing projects. So the more you're doing the projects, obviously the up to date you are. Um, I did a big transfer from a couple of softwares like from 3ds Max to Maya because I saw there was a big industry shift that was happening there. Um, there's somewhat of an industry shift happening with Blender, although it's kind of a false shift because in the games industry it's like we still really need Maya for like retopology and stuff. Um, it's just the, all the um, free energy is in Blender, so it looks like it's very popular. Um, but the game making game assets aren't isn't that great. Like it's good for um, rendering out rendering out things. Um, and apart from that, yeah, just just making projects and keeping up to date with any software update and seeing if that can either optimize some workflow or if there's a cool thing I want to try try out. Um, I always like testing out different s types of tech. So um, I do lots of like environments, foliage, weather systems, characters, creatures, um, and testing out how to achieve very specific things. So whether it's like dreadlocks for um, a very specific type of drapery or, or a specific shader. So that can be a fun, it's fun sort of like learning process is just like trying to discover how to do something. Okay, I reckon we can go high resolution. We, I really, really, you see if I, <laughs> I refrain from going up resolution very too soon. Um, this time it was probably a bit extreme. I was making a case for it. So when we do Dynamesh, it means that the ears are going to connect. So it might be an idea to split those off first. Okay because we still want to actually finish those ears. When you go up a, um, a subdivision layer or a Dynamesh layer, I suggest uh, instead of being being a bit more like tactic of, tactically smooth, so just smooth um, components instead of just like broad, broad area. Like obviously, if you don't want to see a certain part, you can smooth it quite extremely, but it's sometimes nice just to smooth by feature that you see.
So ignore the nose look here. It first has to look a bit like this before we can make it look good. So <laughs> there's going to be a nasty little um, corner here. It's going to look like Michael Jackson a bit. So I'm doing a terrible thing which is just making a nose without a reference so much better to follow along with something but this guy doesn't exist so we are sort of forced to do that I guess him being Balenciaga, it's going to have quite a few sharp features. So the hard thing about sculpting lips is to not accidentally make the pout that they're doing in real life because then it's really embarrassing. But you, I often find that I'm doing it like I'm actually trying to do the uh, lip structure that they've got. I'm surprised that the side isn't as messed up as it can be. Usually when you're doing the lips from the front, you go to the side and then it's like completely off. Okay, so we'll double check with the mouth as well that it's um, wrapping around the teeth. So just bring these sections back. Just so it's got a, a uh, like your grandma's dentures, that kind of, kind of shape going to it. Doesn't make much difference from the front, but when it starts to um, be a bit more 3D, it does help. Okay, let's sort this out. Now, as an artist, right, you can have a lot of traps, so obviously spending too much time on a specific area or trying a little too hard to match a specific reference. You know, at the end of the day, the end user is not going to care that um, this is matching this reference identically. They just they just want to see the um, the sort of like the brand and the emotion from it. So <laughs> do remember not to get stuck in the weeds like I am. But Perfection. Perfection is the enemy of good, as they always say.
So what sort of angle is this guy doing? He's sort of like that. His nostrils are flaring a little bit. There's quite a divot here. some questions yeah I saw your questions in the discord it's just um, finding a spare moment to do it like I want to give them a bit of justice you know not just skim over it in um, in a discord chat uh, so I might do some videos for that because they're big questions you know I they're worthy of an entire video Any tips on retope and projecting details back in ZBrush when I make an eye bag in Maya? Eye bag? Not heard of an eye bag? Uh, it seems to really mess up the projecting process. Uh, you may be like a mouth bag, like an internals. Yeah, that's definitely a process technique you need to get used to. Um, I suggest separating them when you edit, whenever you do a projection and then welding it on manually. Do you make hard service stuff in ZBrush or Maya? ZBrush. Uh, what do you suggest to newbies like me? Um, so I guess more details on how far along you are, what your goals are, um, and what you've been doing so far. But I would definitely learn learn sculpting in ZBrush, and don't be scared to go straight into um, retopology and games game stuff. That's really going to differentiate you from someone who's just like learning how to do ZBrush. Uh, the, the guys that can go in and actually retop something, bake it, and make it real time, that that make you difference. Um, watch streams, watch videos, all that sort of stuff, and actually just make stuff. Never assume that you know how to make it. Um, go and do it. I see that a lot with students. Is that they, yeah, I know how to do that, so I don't need to learn it. But when they actually get into it, all these errors come up, and then they come come back and go, how do I make this? Uh, if you were a student, what software would you use for hard surface? I would use, well it depends what kind of hard surface. I think like if it was um, topology based hard surface, like subdiv, I'd use Maya. Um, no, no, I'd use Blender maybe or Maya. And then for just everything else I'd use ZBrush. And I, I think I've got a video for that as well on like how to sculpt, sculpt in ZBrush and then use don't know if I made the video for it, but re using retop to actually make that hard surface stuff. So, putting in this indication of an eye, and then we, oh, we can put an eyeball in just to see how it's going to look. Or maybe put a bridge on those glasses because it's annoying. So how are you guys enjoying it so far? Are you finding this useful? I'm sort of testing it out um, to see if I'd be able to sculpt, uh, sculpt some stuff and like answer questions on a Sunday. Yeah, and with a lot of hard surface stuff, um, everyone wants to be very precise with their hard surface. You know, like make these perfect edges, perfect bevels, and triple edge loop corners and stuff. Like throw that out the window. It's pointless. Just sculpt something that roughly looks like that hard surface, and then fix it all later. Because um, making things with Maya and all these edges and flows is, is just takes so much time, and it stops the creative process quite hard. 
know, sometimes I don't even um, append a box. I'll just like sculpt a box on top of it. <laughs> so it's just so much faster. nice thing about the primitives as well like they give you not that much geometry so when you do make a move it almost looks um, quite hard surface anyway before I put these glasses on I want to fix this head Damn, this hair is this this hair is jazzy, man. Let's get let's get that down. Give Harry Potter some uh, better posture there. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually trying to make some space for the glasses before I put them in. Oh my god, look at this here. <laughs> right, let's get this, uh, let's mask that. And then Sculptures Pro, and then just smooth all that way. We'll trim it away. And then I'm going to start inflating that ear.
It's really good to watch your process. It makes me reflect on how I can make my methods in ZBrush fast because of right now. It takes me a long time to make anything. Yeah, it takes takes long to make loads of things, doesn't it? Um, I just had a heart attack because the new emergency alert system has been tested in my area. Dude, I just heard that. <laughs> so, what the hell was that? I heard like some. Um, I thought it was like a YouTube thing that was happening to me, but it was actually like an alarm system. So was it like a nuclear thing down here? We live in this. I. They could be doing it around the, the country. Okay, stay on track. We're making an ear. So, loads of people have different styles of ear connection. Um, and it's going to be sort of like, kind of towards the back actually. Now Harry's one, I'm assuming it's quite a skin connected one. So it's going to blend and he doesn't seem to have too much of a lobe. So this is all going to be one continuous connection to about there. It's just it's a damn AI ear, man. It's uh, <laughs> got to match the reference anyway. Okay, so we are trying to get this shield shape back in with his head. He is so wide on the top. It's funny. He's sort of like squished a bit. Okay, there's a big four head section here. Try and like create that negative space. Let's adjust this so it's close to the reference. Maybe a cheeky dynamesh. So I mean, the the nice thing about sculpt is hair. We keep it like this, um, and then later we can decide if we want to either sculpt it better, add some additions, or turn it into like a simulated hair. But for this, I'm just going to keep it sculpted. Do like a vague indication of where the hair is laying. Nothing special. So every, every brush I use is basically some kind of formation of a default brush. This is, uh, so for like hairlines I just use a damn standard. Um, and if for anyone it's just for me to see where things are flowing. And then I can bulk that up later with maybe like a clay brush or a clay build up. Also, when you're working from a reference that does only have sort of like one one perspective shot from the front, um, obviously we're trying to make a bit of a silhouette here, but it's important to note where that silhouette is uh, being made. So is it made, being made by the front of the hair, like this section, 
or is it being made by the back of the hair or is it being made by the center so it's really important his hair seems to be emanating from sort of like towards the front so what I usually do is just get that location that I identified bring it out make a bit of a spike and I can use that as the front silhouette so just there and now we can sort of sort of just adjust it Okay, so he's he's getting a Balenciaga vibe. Uh, let's just get the proportions fixed a bit. Make sure this glasses is resting on his nose. Because obviously everything has to be physical. Has to make sense. And the more you look at a reference, the more weird it gets. So <laughs> here's, uh, here, here we go. He, I knew that what we might be getting into is that his head's getting a bit long. So that happens when you're working, you know, if we're working on the chin here, it naturally wants to, when you add clay, it naturally like comes down. Or if you're working on the top of the head, obviously we're bulking up hair. So it naturally wants to go higher. So you always have to come back and just make sure that uh, you readjust everything. So at this point, I'm going to do like a, a little bit of a readjustment. I'm going to try use a very big move brush. Might be an idea to put it near the reference, just so I don't have to keep on looking, looking across the place. His uh, cheekbones are a little bit weird, so they're a bit wider. Almost like he's got a large, a large skull, like an over-exaggerated eye socket. So a human's eye socket would be small. His seems to be quite large, but also that could be the, the style of the glasses that are throwing off that perspective. So when people wear makeup and glasses, obviously it can be a bit difficult to sculpt because the whole point of the glasses and the whole point of the makeup is to deceive. In a nice way, obviously. Like, Makeup's great, but it's probably safe to put the corners of the glasses on now. In fact, actually, what I'm going to check is just the three fourths here. So this might be leading forwards a little bit too much. Bring out this area. I'm trying to go for like that kind of shape, like a diamond from where the, the eye sockets are. The brow usually comes up a little bit and comes out from the three fourths view. So just see what effect that had on your front and side view. Just make sure you didn't mess anything up. There's a cavity here. But that's because the style of his character is actually sucking his cheeks in. So you would have quite a cavity on the silhouette there, um, as annoying as it is. Let's pull his head back a bit. So the head, if you just have a neck on a head, it's going to be very, um, it's going to throw you off quite a lot because you need the shoulders to seat, seat the head. So I might have to push some shoulders in just so I can get the, the right perspective of the, the neck and the connection. Um, so we'll move on to that after I get the glasses in.
I've forgot this little bit. Um, and then when we're making glasses in ZBrush or like the games industry, you don't want to put the glass in because ZBrush is pretty crap at rendering anything transparent. It also has a bug, which is, you've probably seen me do it about 12 times, is that when you come out a move tool and then go back to a brush, for some reason it like gets rid of the alpha. So <laughs> there's lots of strange things about the software. Um, but it's pretty good. So I mean, Balenciaga is like it's borderline attractive but sad. So <laughs> might look like he's about to sort of like burst into tears at any point. Like he's having a little sulk. Okay, to know at this point I've literally just been in um, orthographic view the whole time, so non-perspective. Might be an idea every now and then to come out just to see uh, what sort of uh, physicality the, the character has. And if anything's sort of like looking a bit strange, you can get a better sense for like the, the size of the nose for example. So in perspective the nose is looking quite large and that's because it is. So what we can do is just like reduce the size of it. I want to lower it. Yeah, let's see. Damn, I missed the stream. Also, hi. Hello. Is this a trend? Balenciaga Harry Potter. I mean, yeah, I saw a... Uh, well, first of all, you can... I think it's recorded, right? So you can watch for it. Um, there might be a lot of fluff at the start, so I was um, setting up some references. Um, the Balenciaga, I think it's just like AI-generated... An AI-generated video, like um, depicting Harry Potter as like in the Balenciaga universe. So it just made me laugh, and so I thought, great, I want to sculpt it. And so that's how you should approach most things, you know, have a little bit of fun of it. If um, something entertains you, maybe you can interpret it in your form. So if you're a 3D modeler or you're a games artist or um, a 2D concept artist, just like try and represent that. I'm 
Okay, let's work on some anatomy. Let's just make sure he's got a good looking cheekbone. Let's get some other bits in. I need a, need a bigger reference for this. So we're getting going for an hour and a half. That went very fast. So it seems, you know, we've got the the main theme there, which is quite cool. Obviously, we've got to do the eyes. But I think once we get some clothing in, it's going to really look like the meme. So... Very funny. You never know, next week I'll do like Dumbledore or do some um, different Balenciaga Harry Potter characters. Is there Balenciaga Warhammer? That's great. <laughs> okay, we'll have to look at that. Maybe that can be some, some hard surface stuff. Right, clothing time. So let's build some shoulders out first. This is all going to get covered up, so I'm not fussed too much about how it looks. Um, we'll just do some basic. <laughs> it kind of looks uh, pretty strong for Harry, Harry Potter right now. Like flexing. Okay, the only thing we want to do is get mass. So this will this will just be an indication of where the clothes can go, and where they'll they'll slightly stop. So, so Balenciaga models, I guess they're infamous for like wide shoulders or un unrealistic looking shoulders. Okay, we want this um, this trap here. This wants to flow a bit nicely, a bit nicer into the neck, like that. And with the next next connection to the body, I usually like to keep the neck separate because obviously that's where all the um, the bones and the muscles are contained, um, and then everything around it is quite cavernous. So, for example, it's quite divoted in here, and then the front silhouette is made by the back muscles here. So you can just sort of shape those out. If you're a strong person, you usually have traps that come out like that a little bit. Normal people just quite flat. And then to separate the shoulder from the main body, just put like a little transition there, just like a, a damn standard with um, trim dynamic. But anyway, this isn't this isn't an anatomy class yet, so I'm going to just get some clothes in.
So he's got a shirt. What I'll do first is make the the folds of the shirt, like that kind of like lapel look. Um, for this I'll use a plain 3D. Now there's a couple of ways we'll do this, or could do this. Um, Mainly what I like to do, so basically what I like to do is treat it like it's a physical piece. So I'll make it long enough that it can wrap around the character's neck. Let's say if we're starting from back here. Make it a little bit longer. Okay, and also we want to make it as tall where it can be folded in half. So I can solo that. At this point might be an idea to go into geometry and then use dynamic subdivisions and then with dynamic subdivisions toggled you can use um, a thickness and so that's just like a previewer so any Z remesh or any features that will change is not going to be affecting this dynamesh subdivision um, I'll look at the geometry basically what I'll do is I'll make a bit of a V shape and I can do that with smart, smart masking or intelligent masking not to confuse substance painter um, we can select the top half and then quite literally just invert it and then we can bend it that's just a very quick way I usually pull it back a bit and then it creates like a nice little bevel there so this is going to be the inside of the shirt and then that's going to be the outside his is quite folded okay right so now we got this piece of geometry to play with Let's save before we do any advanced stuff. Um, I'll come into oh god, look at look at this. Okay, I'll come into move gizmo, and then there's a useful deformer called the bend curve, and then we can insert more resolution into that curve. Maybe just five to start with, and then if you look at it from the top with symmetry on. Or in fact, let's not use symmetry because it's it's going to be um, a unique character. Okay, and then you can basically just wrap a collar around. And then use that as a starting point. So this, um, this Balenciaga collar is very big. Don't know why, it's just fashion. Now, what might be an idea? You can uh, you can squeeze and twist these with these informers, so you can get the collar to rotate slightly. Make sure that it's got the right right angle. He's got a closed shirt, so it's going to be very close to each other like this. Okay. That's good. The from the reference I'm looking at, his collar goes up pretty f far as well on the back, so it looks to be aligning to the back of his hairline. Um, and then his shirt one is about half of that, so it's around his Adam's apple. So I'll aim the the mid shirt for that reference point, sort of like around here. So it's always good to take note of that early um, to save you a bit of time. Cool, that's good. So after that, I'll just accept it, um, and then I'll use the move tool just to get the basic shape of it. Move topological is going to be good for these sections.
I'll show you a cool trick with this after, so after you've done some heavy manipulations there's a way of um, making it nice and neat. But the good thing about this process is it's, um, it's all sculpt worthy, so it's like highly creative. Yeah, I would define that as a complete feature, then I'd move on to a ne the, the next section, like the lowest common denominator. So that would be the leather jacket. So what we could do, could be smart about this, we could actually duplicate this collar, make it larger. Or it might have a little trouble, so it will have trouble if I heavily manipulate it. So what could be an idea, instead of du um, duplicating it, we can duplicate it to store the shirt, go back to the original, and then scroll the history all the way back. Okay, and then now we've got this piece, then we can come back to the move the former and then just make the new section. But first, uh, it's worth scaling up. There are more streams. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I enjoyed this. So, and if you guys found it valuable, those are the two metrics that I'm going off. Uh, is if I enjoy it and you guys enjoy it as well. I mean, if you have any suggestions for streams, um, I mainly look in the Discord. Okay, now so the the AI reference hasn't done very well in interpreting the jacket so it's actually not very clear what the collar's doing um, it's kind of blended back into the it's like a, a leather wrap it's kind of strange so we just have to assume what's going on there it's um, it's probably trying to interpret a very large jacket collar which is flat on this section, so it's opening up slightly. At this point it might be cool to add some color so let's just go into the sub tools turn on all the poly meshes here and the poly paints I use it quite a lot so I have um, the fill col uh, fill object here like I hotkey it and I also put it on the side piece that means I can pick a color like a gray scale which I put on top and then fill the object and then I come back to the original just very quick. Damn, Harry Potter, fuck yeah, no.
Okay, I guess we can turn this into a bit of a, a bust. So I think we'll end once I get some eyes in. I think that'll be a good finaliz finalization. Um, I'll also do a very quick interpretation of a, of a shirt. So I will just do this kind of like free form. Uh, what I'll do. Dynamesh, we got some nice resolution. And I'll mask this section just so I know which bit's being shown. Now that's the bit we're working on. So if you've seen my other videos, you'll understand that I like to make um, hard surface elements with just sculpting in. As you can see it's quite fast and then I would polish it up later with things like edge polish trim. So it's very useful to sculpt in something like this quickly and then you can pass it on and then find out if you're doing it a different way maybe it's a simulated piece of cloth um, or your art team decides to do something else with it. Some very simple sculpting of the cloth, nothing special. bring some asymmetry in. Looks a bit too perfect. So I might change the background colour because he has a black leather. I usually have um, 
black so it's very easy to see silhouettes but in this circumstance we do need a different one so So guys, how are you enjoying Balenciaga Harry Potter so far? Have I done an okay job? It's honestly very intimidating starting from a sphere. And going live. <laughs> So I'll bring it down a little bit further and that's just to basically like accentuate this these end flicks because in the um in the ai generation it's kind of like interpreted that and given that like balenciaga look so i'm trying to make sure that that's coming across
so what I need to do is I actually need to merge the neck and the head because otherwise it'd be quite difficult. Yeah. Honestly, at the start, I thought this would take you a while, but watching from the start now, it makes me feel like I should just try and be less calculated and be freeform. Yeah, to be honest, this took longer than it would usually be because it's um, sort of like talking through the process as well. But surprisingly, um, yeah, an hour or two, you can get something knocked out, like a concept. The hard stuff and the things that take the most time is make it into a games mesh or just like polishing up certain areas so for example if I now go into the eye it might take another 20 minutes but we might as well do it okay so we <laughs> look at this guy <laughs> so uh, with the eyes you can go macro append eyes Crazy Harry Potter. Right, let's. Yeah, when I even when I paint the iris and the cornea and all that, um, I don't use radial symmetry or anything. I just kind of keep it a bit rough. So with the eye, 
you're basically aiming for about 50 50% 50 on this side 50% on the inner side depending on the size okay so Radcliffe's got blue eyes I think So this, I mean, you could use like uh, some pre-made eyes, you can buy those all over the place or just make your own sets. Um, but this is just as fun. With the cornea, I'll basically do um, like an offset black and then a deep black for the actual iris. Uh, you can also put a tiny little highlight at the bottom and fake shade at the top with a darker colour. What's also going to be important is um, fake, fake AO. So it's going to look crazy until we do the, um, the eyelashes and the eyeball. So this is a bit of fakery really, it's, it's, it's basically just like 2D concepting a picture of an ion. It's probably going to look a bit crappy, but oh well. As you can tell, I am not a 2D artist. Okay, that's going to do for the time being. Right. Okay, so let's just, now we've got that, we can use that as a reference for scaling the eye. So I usually like to draw the cornea and the iris in first, and then use that as a scaling reference, as long as it's 50% on the inside, 50% on the outside. Um, you could do the overall eye, but you can't actually see the overall eye unless you're in transparency mode. Um, so it's a useful, useful trick. Okay, it looks like Stoner Harry. So let's get, let's sculpt the cavity out. So basically, like get rid of the socket. This is where it's very useful because now we can build eyelids around this, but then keep the structure of the bone like all around there. So it's um, it's nice, <laughs> it's nice and accurate. Okay, at this point, you'll have to bear me, bear with me. Well, it's gonna look funny. So I'll also push them in so it's about one eye's length in between as well and vaguely one eye on the outside but this is a sort of a stylized character. Um, and then at this point after you've done those eye sockets you come back and adjust the surrounding areas so it fits and matches that eye. So for example we can change the width of the nose to better reference this, uh, the scale of this eye. Maybe some of the, the outer bones and stuff. Okay, intense Harry Potter. Young Johnny Depp, yeah, it does actually. Yeah, it really does. Maybe that's where the AI sort of picked it up from. Okay, with the eyelids, here's another cool trick. So I'll duplicate the eyeball, hide the poly mesh. Let's turn it to a grey. Just make it slightly, slightly bigger from the center. Then I'll mask the top and then I'll come and basically split that off. Uh, let's, let's dynamesh it first actually, just so we can do that. So yeah, I'll mask this top and then I'll come to split. Then I'll re-dynamesh it and then that gives me two sections of a lid that I can start to play with. So obviously the top one, we're now going to go to a bit of a, a Pac-Man look. So I'm just going to rotate the top one, 
rotate the bottom one and it's going to look funny and hideous but we can fix it <laughs> so looking at the reference and then that gives us basically a borderline and then we can create the silhouette of the eye so he's, he's actually got quite opened up eyes at the top for some reason um, the bottom of the eyelid usually aligns with, depending on how tired the person is, the bottom of the cornea. Okay, now what we can do is if we hide everything and just show the lids in the eye, we can look from the top, basically grab this section, pull it out, and also the inner section. That's going to create the inside of the eye. Then you can add some more, you know, some people like to put some actual anatomy in there as well, but sometimes I just sculpt it. Let's bring everything out. So with the eye, I'll also look at the negative space of the whites. So the whites of the eye. His one's quite small and it's um, very triangulated. So I'll try and replicate that with the new mesh that we've done. So I get the top. It needs to come in slightly. But remember when you're working with the eye, in doesn't mean side to side, it means wrapping around. So you have to take some different angles and then pull it out like this. We could do something pretty smart as well. We could start to hide hide and show parts of the eye. So with the main character, you could um, control and shift and then basically only show the eye section, hide the glasses and all those sorts of stuff. Now it definitely looks like Johnny Depp, especially with the black, the black lids. Okay, so now we basically got all the components to make the shape of the eye. So you can make edits depending on if there's a, a bit of fat sort of like going over. Some people have that, um, especially older people where they don't have as much like collagen around that area. There's a nice divot that usually happens above the inside of the eyelid there. It's usually a line that comes down like that. I want to remember we want to have a clear indication of where the edge of the bone line is. So if it's missing a bit, just reinsert it like that and then you can shape it around the eye um, and then this this sort of harsh transition we're going to cover up later when we blend it all back in so there's going to be another bit of skin that basically goes on top of that um, the outside of the eye again is just like looking at the negative space so what I do is bring these forwards and just close that area so it might involve a bit of this Then in terms of thickness, I usually like to give it a little bit more thickness than is realistic, just so from a distance it looks good. Um, it's the same with characters. We want a lot of geometry to collect um, normal map information. So it's usually a good habit to get into. Let's shape this a bit. So when you're making the eye, um, I suggest focusing on a couple of points. So obviously the center is the main point. Uh, the corners of the eyes, like how are they aligned to the center? Are they up from it or are they down from it? Um, the center of the eyelid, where is that? What's the arc like? Does it uh, is it very acute at the top? Like basically, what's the parabola there? Um, and also the negative space that we went through. So how much of the eyes of the white are showing? And then if you go along those lines, you'll get quite accurate with um, whatever reference you're basically trying to copy. Okay. Now what I'll do is basically just fill in a 
bit of skin around here so it almost blends. So when we come to Dynamesh it all together, it will look nice. <laughs> so it always looks funny at this point because the eye eyelids are so perfect. They're almost like hard surface metal. Okay, this area is usually quite tight, so the bone comes very close to the eye, right there. So that bone, that bone has its reasons, right? It's to protect your eye, so that's why it's usually quite close and just a, it's usually a little bit further extended from the head. I reckon we're going to have some fixing to do because I hit the um, hit the geometry there and made some moves, so I'm probably going to mess up a bit. Okay, so let's see how that looks from a distance, bring everything back, because, um, hey, hey, there we go, told you that would happen. Um, it could be that other objects in the scene are going to throw that visual off and make it look disproportionate, so we just have to double check that it looks all good together. <laughs> His eyes are so open, we'll fix that. He look he looks spooky, yeah, exactly. Do you bake this model afterwards? Yeah, we could bake it, maybe put it in Unreal Engine. It was that could be the next one potentially. Um which software do you use for colouring? I would use Substance Painter. Um maybe like a, a teeny tiny bit of reference colouring in ZBrush. Um and then if it's a kind of like a AAA close up cinematic character, I would incorporate a little bit of Mari. Um, just so it can handle high high resolution. Okay, so now let's start to tweak this. I want to reduce his eye size. So in the reference, he's kind of he's also got a bit of a squint. eyes are very similar to the mouth so any 
micro change that you make completely changes the emotion. Um, so that is one very difficult thing about characterists um, is that we have these AI systems known as people that are really good at assessing the emotion of a character. So <laughs> it is the hardest test. Okay, let's start to um, let's blend this back onto the main guy. Dynamesh. Okay. Now, when we soften it, we've got at least we've got um, a nice eye line that was easy to position at the start. Like if that was connected to the actual head, it'd be very difficult. So now I can just sort of blend it back in with the skin. Oh, I forgot this. Do the ears at the same time. Tell you what, he also has very funny AI eyes. AI eyes. <laughs> they are not how they should be. But um, if I am copying a reference, I'll try and get it like as close as possible. To be honest. So what's missing here? Please. Damn standard with a low intensity and a high focal shift. Can bring back a bit of this eye socket. Can you see what's happening here? So it's a very broad move. Um, and it means we don't have to like sculpt too aggressively. And unfortunately, we can't see what's actually happening underneath his glasses there.
Okay, now let's put some AO in there. The AO surprisingly changes it quite quite a lot. Um, it's always nice to have actual like z one weak point of ZBrush is that it's very difficult to like get the eyes in there. That's why I often just leave them blank or um, start to preview it in a different engine basically. It's almost not it's sometimes it's not even worth putting them in. <laughs> to fake AO. Mutiny, I can't seem to get the fur shader opacity to work in substance and put the OP shader on as well in substance. Um, so yeah, double check you've got the 
you've obviously got the channel um, you also have to change the shader so it will be like alpha dithering, dithering or something like that um, but in all honesty if you're trying to like preview shader stuff just start to look at it in your renderer so maybe it's like marmoset or unreal engine because they don't they don't go one to one they don't look very good out of substance
It literally does look like jo Johnny Depp. That's crazy. Oh my god, I love it. Right guys, what do you reckon? Shall I finish it around here? Or what uh, What improvements can you see? I'm probably starting to get a bit of um, artist haze from looking at this guy so much. Do some fake details on the hair. Just do the um, Z brush budget hair, which is just snake hooks all over the place. So usually I just insert random snake hook information and then morph it all over the place. The trick with sculpting hair is to sculpt it as little as possible <laughs> and uh, 
only sculpt it where it's uh, actually making a bit of a difference. Because we don't have time, we don't have time for that kind of stuff. As long as we get the gist. He's got a very annoying haircut, which kind of swirls all over the place, so to interpret this is going to be quite difficult. Those eyes, they're a bit saturated. It's kind of throwing it off a bit. Uh, I hate zebrafish eyes. They suck. So the eyebrow is a good one, you can basically, um, we can just extract some clay and use that as, as the eyebrows.
Okay, back to budget here, snake hook. It's always handy. So look, that is so Johnny Depp, isn't it? Have you explored ZBrush rendering? It's quite fun to make the BPR, uh, NPR shading. I have, yeah. Um, up to you, mate. Enjoying the vibe. Nice. <laughs> Don't feel obliged to spend half a day with us. Yeah, no worries, man. It's. Uh, I just wanted to see it completed to a state where it looks like a 3D Harry Potter Balenciaga. So that, that's basically it. And if there's tips along the way that's useful, that's also a bonus. But no, I would never, never force myself here. If it, you know, like if you're doing art and it starts to suck, just step away from it. Um, but I'm quite enjoying just like dabbling with this. so the main thing is it looks good from whatever your target is so if it's like a, a thumbnail or just like an art station thumb just make it look good from a distance
Ah, oh, fucking hell. Right. Okay, let's see if we can get a, a render. Graphic or perspective, I don't know what's better. The the reference shot is quite a big focal length camera, or short one. Oh, fuck. Okay, there it is, guys. Let's get a photo of it. Maybe we will come back to it and make it real time, put in Unreal Engine. That could be quite cool. Do some like retop and stuff. But um, yeah, thanks for joining me. So if you haven't already, you know, subscribe. I'm going to be releasing lots of YouTube content. So it's like basically how to low poly things, make high poly representations like this mesh. Um, there's loads and loads of stuff to come. I'll probably do a couple of more live um, sessions again. Also with maybe like a different Balenciaga thing, like the Warhammer session was quite cool. Um, and also make sure you join the Discord community. So that's basically where I look at. I recognize a couple of you guys from there as well. Um, so yeah, enjoy the rest of your Sunday and any projects that you're working on. And I'll try and work out how to end this stream. <laughs> cool. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you.